The Greg Scheinman Podcast is brought to you by Inns Group Insurance. Inns Group Insurance and Risk Management. Inns Group is ensuring success. And also, Rose Studios, endurance, strength, and mobility equals perfect fitness. Visit rosestudios.com for more information. So I was first introduced to Anna Catalano by my good friend, uh, Naren Ariel, who is the entrepreneur and founder of the amazing self-publishing company called Mascot Books. Uh, Naren's actually working with Anna on her first book and thought that it would be a good idea for us to connect, and I am grateful for that because she is a truly inspiring and motivating individual, and her story is, is really amazing. Uh, she's got a unique background, was incredibly candid and open about her journey, and really brings a, a fresh perspective to, to conversations. She's also been recognized in Fortune Magazine's ranking of the most powerful women in international business. On top of all this, personally, she is a wife, mother of two, and a graduate of the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. We'll get into that a little bit with my background as a University of Michigan Wolverine. So with that, let's get to the Greg Scheinman podcast. Our guest today is Miss Anna Catalano. Tell me a little bit about how your career started um, and how you got from Illinois to BP, and and we'll start there. Okay. Well, I started actually in Kansas City. So um, I went to school in Illinois, but home was in Kansas City. And my career started when I got a summer job with Amico while I was going to college. Um, A friend of mine had a father who was a division manager of the pipeline office in Kansas City, and I was looking for a summer job. And um, I interviewed and and landed the job, so it was was great. And I spent three summers while I was in college working in the Amico Pipeline office in Overland Park, Kansas, doing secretarial work. I did typing, I did filing, I did paying bills, I did all those things that you have summer interns for. Um, Nothing glamorous, but um, it was great, and the money was great, and I got to work with wonderful people. And so when I was graduating with a degree from University of Illinois in business, I asked um, the people at Amico, you know, do they do they hire from college? And they and they said, yeah. And they said, what's your degree in? And I said, well, it's going to be in in business and marketing. And they said, well, there's a marketing office upstairs. You might call up there and see if you can get an interview. So I I called. I, I looked up this person's phone number in the in the building directory and called and I said, can I? I was just wondering, I'm going to graduate from college. Can I come up for an interview? And this lady who answered the phone kind of chuckled. And she said, "Um, yeah, you can. Um, Mr. Stubbs is in Chicago this week, but um, he's got some time next week to to talk to you. And I said, okay, fine. So we made made a plan to to do that. And um, the following week, I decided to, to, it was my time to go up for the interview. And I walked up there. And realized when I got off the elevator, the walls turned to paneling. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my God, this is actually an important person. And I went in and as it turned out, he was regional vice president of the marketing office in Kansas City. And I was just, I was tremendously embarrassed because I went in thinking this was just some guy I was gonna talk to. And he was the nicest man and I ended up, to make a long story short, um, ended up with an interview with them, um, interviewed in Chicago, and before I went for my last semester of college, I had a job offer from Amico. So I, I'm one of those weird people that didn't go through college campus interviewing. I actually had, a, had an offer um, before I graduated, so it was wonderful. Do you think, because now you, you mentor a lot of people and, uh-huh. and women in, in business and talking about leadership, does that, can that happen today? I mean, I find that it is really challenging to get in front of people now. I mean, there are businesses now that don't even publish their phone number, and they certainly don't publish their their email address of, of, of their executives. And you see all this activity and things that they're doing, and you may know who some of these individuals are, but people are, are generally, in a way, it seems like trying to be unre- unreachable almost. Can that experience that you have, can that still happen today or, or what do you think for for those that are that are coming up or, or want to be like you <laughs> you know I think it can still happen it is more difficult today I think that we've we have made things a lot more formal we've made we we've created more lines of of kind of security if you will that you have to go through to reach people today on the other hand y- there's you can still do cold calls 
and, and it still works from time to time and you can still get through. So I think, you know, in my case, ignorance was bliss. I didn't know better that then I wasn't supposed to do this. Um, but, you know, sometimes it works in your favor. And, and, and I think that you have to have the courage at times to do it in the right way. You don't want to be obnoxious about it and start stalking people. But I think that, you know, if you, if you have an opportunity to meet people, whether that's by chance or whether someone introduces you, make the best of that opportunity, take advantage of that opportunity. Because I have found in my 30 plus years in business that business is all about relationships and meeting people, keeping in touch with people and working those relationships. Let's talk about that a little bit because I, I agree with you um, that it is about relationships and, and, and building a network. How did you or how do you still go about doing that? Now you're sitting on a number of boards and then you're transitioning in uh, another phase of, of your life and your career, but how have you gone about building those relationships as you've moved companies and changed responsibilities? Well, you know, we come across all kinds of people in our day-to-day -day business world, and um, we also attend a lot of conferences. We attend, you know, networking opportunities, things like that. And I've always made it a point when I go to events that, you know, there's always the the requisite pass out the business card exercise that everyone goes through. And if I find that I have an interesting conversation with somebody, I make a mental note of it. And as soon as I get home, before I forget, I shoot an email out to people who I think are worth keeping in touch with. And if I go to a you know one day conference, there's usually maybe 10 or 15 people who I've met who I think, you know what, might be interesting to meet up for a cup of coffee sometime and, and see if you know this relationship is, is worth keeping. And out of those 10 or 15, you know, I would say maybe five, six of them respond or respond in a way that makes me feel like they thought the feeling was mutual. And out of those, probably two or three, you end up keeping in touch with. And to me, you know, the, the numbers aren't that great, but the numbers are nothing if you don't do the first step, right? So I, I consider it an investment in my career to follow up on the networking and relationship building. And then what I do is, I, I've always believed that a network is only valuable if you share it. And so my brain is constantly thinking about, as I meet people, who do I need to introduce to someone else who I've met? And I really enjoy doing a lot of that. So, you know, I, I think that that's a real important part of how all of this works. Um, it's, you know, how you get in, introduced to people, how you nurture those relationships, and then how you make sure that you help build that network by introducing them to more people you know. And is that, that's the marketer? That's the marketer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the marketer and the extrovert, I think, in me. <laughs> Truly an extrovert? Or, because I've become pretty fascinated with this introverted, extrovert mm concept of weight that seems to kind of there's been a lot of articles on you know are you truly an extrovert and I'm in, and I'm in sales and, and uh -huh. as, as well in networking as well or that introverted ex, extrovert of when you shut it down you know mm -hmm. and when you need time to your to yourself mm -hmm. I I am I definitely need time to myself I actually work in time in my schedule to 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 think to have quiet, to listen to music so I can reflect on things. I actually enjoy some of my travel because when I'm traveling, I'm not interacting with people. I'm either driving a car or I'm sitting on a plane and it's it's my time. Um, and so I think you've got to balance. I mean, I'm an extrovert from the standpoint of I'm not afraid of meeting new people. I actually enjoy meeting new people. Um, I enjoy meeting people who do totally different things than what I do, and, and I find that very fascinating. So from that standpoint, I'm an extrovert. But I also realize that I can't be like on and broadcasting all the time. Um, I, I do need time to reflect and to, to be pensive about life and what's important to me and people that are important to me. Routine-wise, and, and that work-life balance and, and finding that time. Do you meditate? Do you exercise? Do you walk the dog? I mean, I'm, what, what's, what's the routine? You know, I, um, I, I, don't, I don't formally meditate where you actually sit in a quiet room and you formally meditate. I don't do that. But I know I meditate. Um, and so, you know, I don't think you have to have that carved out of your schedule to do that. Um, but I, I do make sure I spend time um, really thinking. And, and some of my best decisions in my life have come out of times where I basically say, I'm taking a break. I, I need to spend some time 
shutting off all of the inputs and really think about what I want to do. Um, do I exercise? Yes, I do, but not enough. Um, none of us do. So I need to do more of that. And the older I get, the more I realize I need to do more of that. And I probably should have done more when I was in my 20s. Um, but I, I think that's good because I think anything like that that you do reduces stress in your life. And I believe very, very strongly in reducing stress. I've seen evidence that stress can can really destroy. And I know that that's, uh, you know, as, as I see people go through life, I... I I watch them and I say, you know, the one thing that you need to reduce in your life is stress. So you did that. You also obviously were, were working really hard and, and long hours and an international component to everything that you did. So take me through, through that. Um, BP, that kind of lifestyle at the highest level of global marketing, um, the stress related to that, the schedule to that, um, and, and how that affected you. Well, when, when um, shortly after we had kids, um, my, my career started going really, really well. We I did an international assignment in China, which seemed to put my career on a very different trajectory than um, peers were on. And right after that, I, I landed some senior level jobs in Amoco and um, started traveling quite a lot. My um, last job with Amoco before the merger was head of sales operations, which was basically head of the, all the retail operations in the United States. So I did start traveling quite a bit. Our kids were six and three at the time, and my husband was a structural engineer, worked in a consulting firm in Chicago. And there was one day where one of the kids, or maybe both of the kids, got sick, and we looked at each other, and neither of us could take time off. And um, I think we ended up calling his parents to help us out. And you know, I looked at my husband and I said, you know, I think we need to find a nanny. This is going to be really hard. Maybe I'll, I'll start looking for a nanny. I'll ask around. And he looked at me and he said, you know. We brought them into the world. I think we're supposed to raise them. So why don't I stay home with the kids? You're obviously, your career is going very well. You've got more earning power than I do. Why don't I stay home with the kids? And, and I thought, okay. And I said, look, here's the deal. If you stay home with the kids, you, you need to do the stuff at home because I, I don't want to be working and then have to come home and do all the cleaning and the cooking and all the kids stuff. And I said, so if, if this is what you want to do and you're willing to do, then you've got the whole thing. And he said, okay, got it. No problem. I've got it. So when our kids were six and three, Joel quit his job and stayed home full time with the children and ran the house. And he gets actually all the credit for how well our two children have turned out. I, I always give him full credit for that. What that did is it freed up my time to focus on the career during my working hours. And when I was home, I was about the kids and about the family. And so I'm not sure there's a real thing called work-life balance. I, I think that when you're working, you're 100% working, and when you're home, you're 100% at home. That's kind of how I've tried to be. Um, the, the, after the merger with BP, um, the job became much more international. I was traveling around the globe, and I found myself you know, traveling more than 50% of the time for, for, for the most part. And that was difficult because we were living in London. So we were living in a different place. You know, kids were going to you know, a school in the center of London. Um, living in the city is very different than living in a suburb in the United mm -hmm. States. And I, you know, I said, thank God my husband was, was home at the time because that would have been an awful lot to juggle um, between international travel and two kids going through grade school. So um, very lucky. I, I could not possibly have done what I did in my career without my husband being willing to do what he did. And, and for you personally, though, were you immediately comfortable? I imagine that's got to be a big, big adjustment because you've got a career. Your career is on the rise. Um, you make the decision at, at, to become a mother and to have children and, and start a family. And, I mean, these are big, these are big life changes and big relationship changes and, and challenges. Your husband takes on a completely different role. And then you go back... To, the, to, to work and continue to, to as you said, work 100%, you know, uh, towards, what, how was that adjustment for you? Were, you? were you comfortable with that? Did the time toll? I mean, how does that, I don't know, how does that work as, <laughs> as a woman, you know, in an executive role like yourself with children at home, got, and, and in the energy, oil and gas industry, 
How was this dynamic, you know, for you? It it's it was never comfortable, but it was very workable. Um, you know, the adjustment is always hard. I mean, anytime you decide to have kids, there's an adjustment, right? Right? Whether whether you've got a stay at home spouse or not, um, you know, the decision to have kids is the biggest decision you, you make with a spouse. Um, so from that standpoint, it was it, it was always difficult, but. The fact that I was married to someone who really treated this as a full partnership made it a lot easier. I never felt like the decision was mine alone. I never felt like this is what I have to do. Um, I need him to do this because I have to do this. This was everything I was doing was for the family and everything he was doing was for the family. The, the difficulty for me was a personal one. And that is, you know, when when my daughter went to school and was asked to draw a picture that represented her parents. She drew a picture of my husband of him combing her hair. I think that's what it was. And she drew a picture representing me of an airplane. And so, you know, I saw that and I thought, wow, okay. Um, And you think, am I doing the right thing? And then you realize, yeah, it's okay. I'm doing this because it's the right thing for the family. And I also realized in the back of my mind that I was also giving my children a, a, an imprint on their brain that men and women can do whatever it takes to make a family work. And I actually thought that was really important and, and, and my husband did too. Um, there is no doubt in my mind that I've raised a daughter and a son who believe that men and women are equally important in our society and we can all do a myriad of things depending on what's needed. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's an important value that, that we place on kids. A- absolutely. Is that what you're talking to, to people about now? Is that what you're talking to other women about, about now? Um, as, as again, you've, you've taken this journey, you know? Um, and and I, not to skip over, because I definitely want to go back to what you accomplished at BP and then also the decision to move on from, from BP. But... Is this where you're spending spending some of your time? Is this? I know you're, you're thinking about a book and and you're and you're blogging and you're talking about leadership. Um, is it on these these topics to to other other women? I I do quite a bit of public speaking. I speak on a number of different topics. I, I speak about leadership. I speak about board governance. I talk about marketing. But wherever I speak, in the Q and A session that I always build in, there's always the question that comes up that. Um, how did you do it? Do you have kids? Are you married? And the question, especially when I speak to college kids, I, I speak to a lot of universities, a lot of people ask me, you know, how do you do it? And what I tell people is, my story is only my story. And there is no formula for that, that says, ah, this is the secret formula. If you just do steps one, two, and three, these things will happen. This worked for us because it was us. And I tell people that. And, and I say the most important decision you ever make that determines the success of your career is who you decide to spend your life with. And I tell that to everyone. It is the most, it's not whether you took the promotion, whether you took the transfer, what you decided to major in. It's actually about who you decide to spend your life with because all of these decisions are made with somebody, some type of partner, right? And so, you know, I tell people this was what worked for me. And what I try and impress upon people is, that you shouldn't think that there's anything that's prescriptive that will work for everyone. You actually have to figure it out. But yes, it can be done. You Mm -hmm. can figure it out. And there is no reason why you can't make it work. You just have to figure out what works for you. We went through childcare um, permutations and combinations of, you know, come and go nanny when when my daughter was very young drop them off at daycare, first one to be dropped off, last one to be picked up. We went that route also when we were both working. And then we did the stay at home. So we've done a lot of different combinations. And every one of them has been good for the time that we made the decision. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm an advocate of, of, of kind of customized um, work-life balance. Sure. And, and then that's a good segue to when you were at BP... Tell me about the decision and the timing. Okay, next chapter. It's time. It's time for the next chapter. What did you accomplish? Um, did it meet or exceed your goals? When did you decide? Okay, this is 
this is now it's time to do something different because um, that's a huge right. platform right. to to have and to hold that position and then also decide really at that prime of, of your life and decide I'm gonna also do something different it was probably the I know it was the toughest professional decision I ever made um, the merger had happened five years you know kind of four years before I made the decision and um, at the time of the merger Amico Amico was a company where very few people achieved senior management positions until they were in the kind of second half of their careers. So it was an older company. It was a Midwestern company, older company, um, very few senior managers in their 30s. I was, I was very fortunate that I had some wonderful opportunities that availed themselves to me, and I, I actually became a senior manager at quite a young age. So at the time of the merger, many of my colleagues, many of my senior leader colleagues, took the package and, and left because they were re- retirement eligible. Um, a wonderful, wonderful group of people that never I never counted on finishing my career without most of them. And so at the time of the merger, mo- a lot of the Amico people left. And there were a few that, that stayed, a few senior managers, very, very, very outstanding people that stayed. But from a marketing side, there weren't that many of us. And so at the time of the merger, I had to make a decision as to whether or not I was going to stay. And we were living in Atlanta at that time, and I actually was approached by Coca-Cola to potentially interview for a job in Coca-Cola in Atlanta. And I thought, wow, I could do that. I could stay. Maybe I should do this. And then I realized that there were a lot of wonderful people in middle management, young people at Amico, who... I really wanted to see them have a great opportunity in this new company, and I knew that they needed an advocate. And so I was one of the few people that could advocate for on their behalf because I was in a position to do that. And so I actually made the decision to stay because of that reason. We then moved to London, and I was um, I ended up being head of global marketing for BP, and I was fortunate to kind of help spearhead that whole Beyond Petroleum campaign mm-hmm. that BP did. And it was, a, as a marketing person, a wonderful project, if you will, to, to do, because very seldom do you get to rebrand a company as a, as a marketer. So a fabulous project. And as that wound down and as we finished um, doing a marketing strategic work for BP, I realized that I was at an important, kind of a critical stage in my career where I had to make a decision. And that is... If I stayed with the company, I was in the top 40 people in the, in, the, in the company. If I stayed, I would most likely be doing the same thing because, frankly, there are very few oil companies, especially British oil companies, that are run by Asian American women who are marketers. I mean, let's just be honest, right? So I knew that I kind of reached the top of, of you know, my career in that company. And mm-hmm. if I was happy doing something similar to that, I, you know, I'd do it. I also knew that my the current CEO at the time, John Brown, was going to probably be retiring in the next few years. And frankly, wasn't sure about the leadership that I saw emerging. And I thought, you know what? This isn't going to feel the same anymore. Um, and so from a professional standpoint, that was the picture. From a personal standpoint, our family had lived overseas for seven of the last 10 years. We had spent two years in China and five years in London. Our kids were entering kind of middle school age, and I knew that if we stayed in London, the U.S. would not be necessarily in their option set for college, and we kind of wanted U.S. colleges to be in their option set. Mm -hmm. My husband and I also had really great times in high school in in the U.S., and we kind of wanted our kids to experience that as well. Um, And then finally, the, the, the last straw, if you will, is my parents were aging, and Daddy had had a stroke, severe stroke at the end of 2001. And um, it was a reality that hit me that, you know what, they're, they're not getting any younger. And if I want to spend time with family, it'd be much easier to do it back in the States. So I made the decision at the age of 43 to resign. And I left the company. Um, huge decision because I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, um, it's 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 a really big decision when you leave that kind of money on the table and say, I think, I think there's something else in me that I want to do, not knowing what that was. Mm-hmm. Sure. So, 
in doing that also, I mean, I found with, with individuals especially, when your, your identity is also wrapped up a lot within the position and the, and the power and everything that you have. So you, you make that decision to walk away and there's a personal and a professional aspect to it. But you no longer have that card that yeah. says BP, you know, right. global head of, of marketing on it. Um, so how do you, from there, how do you rebrand your marketer again? How do you rebrand and how do you decide what you want to go forward with at, at that point and say, okay, because now we're talking about you personally, not as much of what you've done or the meetings are different. They're no longer the meetings of representing this company and this powerful position in branding, but now it really is all about you and you can do anything, but I guess in the sense you, you hadn't done and everything because you had something very specific to focus on for a very specific entity. I had, yeah, I had spent my entire career with one company. It went from Amoco to BP, but not because of my choosing, but because mm -hmm. the companies decided to merge. But essentially, I had spent my whole career with one company in one industry, by the way, that was not necessarily a marketing industry. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so I, I left and, and, and you know, you, you find yourself in a very, very different situation. In a way, it's quite liberating because you say, oh, gosh, I don't have to go to the office anymore. I don't have to meet with people and I, I don't have this. And on the other hand, it's a huge unknown, right? You, right. Because I've never done this before. Yeah, I've been gonna working take, they for they a long time. Oh, they're going to answer my email now. <laughs> I would imagine it's got to be all of those all of those things. It was, it was very, very different. So what happened when that occurred is I have a network of recruiter friends that immediately called okay. and had... It's, you know, it's like you're, you're fresh meat, right? I mean, it's you're, you're out, you're, you're, you're freshly out, you've just completed this big company rebranding thing, she's easy to market somewhere else. And so they lined up all kinds of interviews for me. So I interviewed mm -hmm. with all kinds of companies for CMO jobs and, and all this. And I talked to some wonderful companies, you know, fabulous companies. But as I progressed in the conversations with them, I realized it felt like what I describe as the same t-shirt in a different color. It really felt like I mean, even the words they were saying, you know, we're not sure, we have an organization that understands marketing, you know, we, we, we need to, you know, we're a commodity, we need a special, and all this, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is the same thing. And so I, I told all my friends, look, give me six months. Don't call me for six months. I need to figure out what I'm gonna do here and whether I want to jump right back into mm -hmm. something very similar to what I was doing. And so we, we actually moved back to the States into a home that we had had as a, a vacation home in Florida, in a lovely town called Vero Beach, Florida, on the Atlantic mm -hmm. coast, and our, put our kids in a little private school there. And um, I, I literally spent six months kind of walking on the beach trying to figure out what I was gonna do, and realized that this was a very, very unique opportunity, that I was totally in charge of what I was gonna do, and I really need to think about, do I wanna do the same thing? Mm -hmm. and. You know, at the time, obviously, I was able to spend a little bit more time around my parents and see what was going on with them. And I realized that they were going to need a little more help. And I thought, you know, how often in your life do you get a chance to give back even a fraction of what your parents have done for you? My parents were immigrants and started with nothing and, and built a family, built an incredible life for me and my three sisters. And I thought, you know, there's an opportunity here to do something. So, um, I'd, I'd also been approached um, to consider board work. And I thought, well, you know, that's interesting because boards of directors kind of know their schedules two or three years out. Board meetings are scheduled out way in advance. And I would know when I need to travel. Um, it would keep me in touch with the business world. And it would certainly give me flexibility that I felt like I needed personally to, to do what I needed to do with my parents. And also, I realized this was a wonderful chance to spend some time with my kids before they got old enough to go to college. Mm -hmm. You know, I had, I had literally spent, I had spent very little time with them other than, you know, being home in the evenings and things like that. And I did as much as I could, but I wasn't there all the time. And I thought, you know what, I, they're, they're really cool people and I'd like to get to know them before they become adults. And so, um, I made the decision to um, not reinvest in a full-time executive career 
but to um, become a, a board director um, on, on a number of public companies. And that's when I decided to build a board portfolio and have never looked back. Where does this confidence come from? You know, <laughs> uh, because you, you tell it and the story is, is, is compelling. Um, and it seems, I think, that, that you process information and situations you know, really well and you look at them and you digest them and it comes across because this makes perfect sense. It, but you know, where, where does your confidence come from to, to do this, to walk, again, walk away, leave money on the table? Um, decide I'm not just going to take that other CMO job or that t-shirt in a different color and go do that. But to say also, I'm going to step back, I'm going to take this time, or I'm going to go in this direction. Because um, I have to believe there's got to be a little, I don't know if fear is the right word of, if I want to go back to this, am I still going to be marketable You know, at that time? Am I missing or, or an opportunity? Or we have maybe this perception in, in the world or in business that you can't you can't get out of it, you know? Like We're all going a thousand miles an hour. We're, we're, work, we're overworking, we're not resting enough, we're probably not exercising enough, but we're climbing the corporate ladder and we're building our network. And then when you step out, can you actually really, really step in? But it seems like you have this kind of innate confidence and, and, and kind of have done it with, with this fluidity that just seems like it all makes sense. Well, it sounds fluid because I'm talking in, in retrospect, right? I mean, I always tell people a, a, a resume always looks impressive because you're looking backwards. Um, at the time it was happening, it's, it's stressful. It's not easy. And, and every decision you make, you're not sure if it's the right one. I would say I have a, a tremendous, um, I, I, I have a tremendous gift in my life that I was blessed with wonderful family. Um, starting from my upbringing with my parents, who instilled in me a belief that the harder you work, the better you are, and that there are some things that people can take away from you, like title, like money, like things, but the things they can never take away from you are what you've learned, and they can't take away your integrity. And I, I think that's very important, and I know that somehow my parents instilled that in me. I have three tremendously supportive sisters as a result of that. And so I have a support group from childhood that is, I, I would say, unparalleled. And I'm very blessed to have that. On top of that, I married the most wonderful man in the world who, at the time I made the decision to leave BP, he and the kids were in our house in Florida and I was in London by myself. And an incident had happened that caused me to say, I think I'm out of here. And he talked me through it on the phone and he said, look, what good is all that money if you're not around to spend it with me? He said, you need to do what you want to do and I'll support you 100%. And he knew that I was struggling with it. And on the night before I was tendering my resignation to the CEO, he called me from Florida and he said, look, I just want to tell you something. He said, if you changed your mind tomorrow and you don't want to leave, it's okay with me. So he gave me 100% support, which then gives you confidence that, okay, whatever happens, I'm going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Even if this is a total bust, I'm going to be all right because I have the important things that I need in my life. And so I think the confidence, confidence never comes from you know, some, something you hang on a wall that tells you you're great. Confidence comes from how you feel inside and whether or not you feel as though you've got support and you've got the support network that it takes to move on to whatever it is you're trying to do. You know, I talk to people who decide they're all of a sudden gonna go run a marathon and they're the most out of shape people in the world. And three years later, they're running a marathon. And I say, how did you do that? And it's, it's a matter of believing in themselves, you know? It's not what someone externally does for you. It's, it's a matter of having that intrinsic motivation that, that causes you to say, I can do this. Now, I, de I definitely believe, believe that, that I think that it, people reach a certain, they reach a tipping point. You know, and, yeah, and, and it's got to be, it's got to come from within. You know, 
no, nobody can, can do any of that for you. They right. can't set the alarm for you to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. They can't walk you into the gym. They can't put the miles on the road right. you know, for you. Um, they can't get you to work harder. I mean, I think we've all, all seen this. You can give the personality tests and you can provide the mentorships and you can do all provide all the resources and other things that are there. But unless you want it yourself, unless you're willing to do the work... And put the time in. It's not going to happen. It's 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 not. That's right. So, you're doing board work now, which which makes up your your career mm-hmm. at this point. How is that? How has that been? How is the? How do you choose the boards that that you're involved with, or or how they've chosen you, and how and how that's fit together? Um, and how has board work been from a satisfying standpoint from a transition from all the responsibilities that you used to have to we're going to meet here and then there take take me through that process a little bit the board work for me has been fantastic for a number of reasons first of all it keeps me in touch with very smart people and and that's one thing that you miss when you when you leave an executive job is the the day-to-day interaction with really brilliant people um i i I'm also really thrilled that I've been able to build a portfolio of many different industries. So, you know, my background is in sales and marketing, right? But I work for an oil company. And so an oil company is not all about sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. And so I've been able to take a a sales and marketing and international relations background. And I've been able to build a portfolio that includes a consumer products company, a professional services company, and two chemical boards, um, which has been terrific because I've learned that, you know, I've learned new industries. I didn't know the first thing about selling infant formula, right? Um, but it's been wonderful. Um, and I certainly didn't know anything about selling insurance. So, you know, it's been, it's been fantastic. But I realized that most companies, regardless of what industry they're in, deal with a lot of the same things. They deal with a business model. Does this business model make sense? How do we compare against our competitors? How do we hire, retain, develop the best workforce? Right. Mm-hmm. How do we make decisions on what countries to move into and which ones to stay out? You know, things like that. And this transcends industries. So it's been wonderful for me from that standpoint to um, be able to learn. I, I feel like I've grown a tremendous amount in this chapter of my, my professional life. Um, and, and I've met some incredible people that I normally wouldn't, wouldn't ever meet up with. It's also allowed me to do a lot of other things that I didn't have time to do when I was a full-time executive, like not-for-profit work, like being involved in an innovation group that I work with at Northwestern University, Um, things like that that would always have seemed very attractive from the outside, and I would have said, oh, wow, I wish I had time to do stuff like that. Mm. Do you think, uh, I guess at that higher level, you talk about being able to get back and, and associate with, with really smart people. You know, do you think that they're more open um, and accepting to allow others that they may find to be equally brilliant you know, or, or bright to again, try new things and deem them capable? Because it also seems that you know, it, it's a double-edged sword. On, on one side, in the corporate world or business and a lot of, what do you want? You want people with experience. You want people with experience doing what, you're, doing what you're doing or doing what your business does. But sometimes having that fresh perspective or that person who may not have experience in your particular industry just can bring so much to the table, you know, with that new perspective. Because again, the fundamental elements that you're talking about and about business are relatively similar. Mm-hmm. Again, what you're doing day to day, the operations, the sales, the marketing, just you may have a different product or a different widget. And, and I say this because also having, you know, getting the opportunity to do this where, where and, and you do 20, 30, 40 different entrepreneurial profiles and what you find of people from all different walks of life is that the stories are very similar and that all these individuals are uniquely capable and uniquely smart and almost whatever ball you... Yet you hand them, they're going to take it and they're and they're going to run with. Um, is has that been your experience? I guess with with the boards is, is what I'm getting at. That do you believe in it? Believe in that? Where let just give smart people the opportunities and they'll figure out, you know, what what to do. Well, I think that there the, the commonality is that entrepreneurs and people who have kind of created their own paths are very driven, motivated people who have picked a lot up along the way. 
Um, whether or not they're super smart, I don't know, but uh, we, we've all picked up different experiences. And I think it is a benefit for a company to have many different experiences around a table. Um, you asked me earlier about how I got onto these boards. And um, you know, when, uh, most of the boards I'm on have come to me through recruiters who are helping companies find a new voice at the board table that they're looking for, specific that they're looking for. And what I always ask people, I consider my, my expertise background that is uniquely different to be marketing, which a lot of board tables don't have, and my experience in doing business in China, which many boards are looking for. And so I always ask the recruiter and then the, the interviewers from the board, what is it you feel like you're missing at the table that I can bring? And if they can't answer that question, I know they haven't done their homework on me and they're probably just looking for a woman because everyone is saying they need women on boards. And I don't want to be a board just because I don't want to be on a board just because they're looking for a woman. I, I'm kind of done with that chapter in my life and I, I don't need it now. And so I tend to look for boards that have just come out of something like a turnaround or they've just become public or they've just come out of bankruptcy or something like that where the executive team is really looking for advice from a board of directors on, are we doing this right? What else are we thinking? What else should we be thinking about that we're not thinking about? So the boards that I'm on do value that different perspective. Even though we have commonalities of we've all been parts of companies or we've run enterprises, we all have different perspectives in terms of our experience. Mm -hmm. You know, as you go through different life experiences, you, you think of different questions to ask. You know, did you ever think about this or am I missing something or is this something that, you know, you should think about? Those are the kinds of conversations that are most valuable around a board table, I think. For the executive team, you also it also makes me think a little bit. You put a lot of successful people around a table, and they've run companies and they've had high profile roles. And you you come off as quite diplomatic. Mm -hmm. uh, personality, the, the you know the the dynamics of personalities are also something that, that always interest interests me. How do people and how do you play nicely with others? You know, <laughs> debate and, and how. How is that? Because that's got to be, I would imagine, you know, you put a lot of type A's in a room, you put them on a team, you put them on, and, and you're going to have you know, some opinionated individuals in conflict. How do you balance you know, in terms of, and how do you work work with others, and what is your ad advice on that? And it's just, I ask also because it's something I wrestle with all the time, you know, <laughs> that that you're talking to to powerful people, you're talking to smart people, and you everybody has their opinion, and where where does that work, you know, around finding common ground. So team dynamics is what you're talking yes. about. It's how do you get teams so you've already to, to, put to it better work, than I did. <laughs> to work to work well. You know, um, one thing that I've always made a point about is when I interview for a board is I insist on talking to everyone on the board at least by phone if not in person. Because I know that chemistry is very important, especially if you are people who only meet 4 to 6 times a year. It's actually really important that those meetings are good. If you're working day in and day out with a team mm -hmm. of people, you really get to know people well right. and you know mm -hmm. about your families and all that stuff. When you're on a board, you have very limited time together. So the chemistry has to be good. And um, uh, you know that, that to me is something that's, that's really important. You've got to have a group of people who have mutual respect for one another's experiences. Without that, it's, it, it's a no starter, I think. You can, you can all be very good at what you do, but if you have someone who really doesn't value the experience someone else brings to the table, that becomes very obvious, and it can be very destructive in terms of board culture and dialogue. I also think, very importantly, is the leadership of the board, the chairman of the board, plays a big role in board dynamics and how well it works and whether everyone is being heard and whether somebody is, you know, not not giving um, relevance to, to what somebody is saying, that's actually really important. So board leadership is and governance is very very important in terms of making sure everyone's voice is heard. What's next now? So you're you're sitting on a number of boards. Um, 
we have you talk about networking and how people get to meet one another, and we actually you know we're, we're introduced through a book publisher um, that, that we both know well. What so there are rumors of a book. What what's next for you? What do you want to accomplish? What do you feel are the future future goals for for yourself? You know, you you go through different stages of your life. Where you know, beginning, you're just trying to slog it out and seeing, you know, can I can I make it? Am I am I going to be okay? You go through the period of time where you're trying to raise a family, and you hope to God that these little people turn out to be, you know, decent adults. You know, and I think that when it comes to your professional career, you you go through stages, and and, and you're always looking for kind of what you define as success. And, you know, early on in your career, it's about things that you can accomplish. And I would say in the middle part of your career, it's about what you can do with a group of people. I would say I'm entering the phase of my career where it's really about how do I enable and help others accomplish the dreams that they have. I, I am very privileged to come across some amazing young people and amazing people who are in their careers and you know, what I hope to do is either through the speaking that I do or the mentoring that I do or potentially the book that I do, um, be able to help other people through some of these stages that I went through in my life where it was really great to have people talking to me and helping me and cheering me on. Um, to me, that's the, that's the ultimate definition of success is how, how good were you at helping others realize dreams that, that they had. And so that, to me, is kind of what I dedicate a lot of my time to these days and and hope to do so in the future. The Greg Scheinman Podcast is presented by Inns Group. Inns Group Insurance and Risk Management. Inns Group is ensuring success. For more information, go to innsgroup.net. And also by Rose Studios. Endurance, strength, and mobility equals perfect fitness. For more information, visit rosestudios.com.